Well, amen, and welcome to King's Cross, friends and visitors. Uh, we're glad you've joined us on this special Sunday, our fifth anniversary as a faith family. Normally right now we move to a time of uh, pastoral prayer. We're an extended time in prayer. We speak out to God. We cry out to God, knowing our good and gracious God who hears us and responds to our prayers according to his good and perfect will for his great glory and for our eternal joy. This morning, uniquely on our fifth anniversary, we're also commissioning and sending out our first church plant. So Christ gave, uh uh-huh, (laughs) uh-huh. Christ in the Great Commission has called his church, given the the mission, the marching orders very, very clearly to make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey everything he's commanded. And he's promised as we make disciples and baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Spirit that he's with us in this work. And so church planting is the natural overflow of the Great Commission to send forth disciples who would go in new places and form new faith families to advance the gospel in new communities in new neighborhoods for the great glory of Christ and the joy of all gathered. So I'm going to ask Pastor Cameron uh, to come up. Cameron has served uh, for two years as a pastor, his family. And also Zane and Preston, their families will be coming up. We'll be sending them out as elders and the rest of the Redeemer Corps team. You guys go ahead and come up. So if we can have the pastors and their families come up on stage. The rest of the core team, please come down. Bring the babies with you. Stand around in front of the stage. And we're going to pray and commission these people. Now as they walk up, we want you to know, for King's Cross, this hurts. We're sending out some of our best and most faithful members, some of our best and most faithful servants of Christ in his church, those who have been making disciples and delighting in God and discipling one another and declaring good news and displaying good deeds. It's fun. Amen. Let them all up here. If we can squeeze up, squeeze up. We'll see if it works. So these members have been members who have faithfully served Christ. And regularly at King's Cross, we say that we're more passionate about the kingdom of God than we are King's Cross. That we want to see the gospel advance in our city and indeed in every city. That every tribe, tongue, and nation would have faithful and healthy churches that proclaim the gospel of Christ and disciple and encourage those in their midst. And so this morning, we're going to lay hands on and send out these precious members. Not because, again, we're ready to get rid of them. Indeed, we're very sad. There's already, I'm looking around, I already see plenty of tears. I've already cried them this morning. But we're sending them out because Christ is worth it that his name and fame is worth it. And there are communities and neighborhoods in our city that need more gospel witness in their neighborhood and their communities. And so we're sending them to the Glenwood neighborhood, particularly about 10 minutes away. And who knows, maybe some of the visitors here, even you will find out and learn more about their work and want to join them in this labor. Our goal is to see Christ spread by the power of the Spirit, the gospel advance in this city. So I'm going to ask now, uh, Pastor Hez is going to pray, particularly for the pastors uh, as they go. Again, uh, Pastor Cameron, uh, and then Pastor Preston, Lord willing, and soon to be, and then Pastor Zane, right here, throw your hands, there we go. Uh, Pastor Hez is going to pray for them, and then Pastor BT is going to commission this family uh, to start this new gospel work. So let's bow before the Lord in prayer. I want to remind you our time of prayer is usually an extended prayer. No, I'm, yes, just play, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Father, we thank you uh, for the opportunity to serve your kingdom, to shepherd your flock, to hear your voice and proclaim it to those who don't know you and to proclaim it to your church, those who you have called, Lord, that they might be exhorted. And so even this morning, we pray, O oh Lord, a word of exhortation that these men whom you have called to shepherd this flock that you are sending out, O oh Lord, we pray that as witnesses of the suffering of Christ, as well as uh, partakers in the glory that is going to be revealed, that they would shepherd your flock, that they would exercise oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have them, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in their charge, but being examples to the flock, so that when the chief shepherd appears, they will receive an unfading crown of glory. Father, we pray that you would grip the hearts and minds of these men, that they will pursue by all means your Christ-likeness, that they will pursue humility, wisdom, 
understanding and steadfast love and that they might proclaim your truth with boldness, that they would lead your flock with gentleness and kindness, but they would stand on your word, not swaying left or right, O Lord, but staying focused on you. May they always be reminded that it's not about us, but it's about our God who we serve. We pray these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Father God, how beautiful is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You have drawn us to yourself through him, and we lift up his name this morning, and we praise you, our Father. And Lord, how precious is this gift you have given us, the bride of Christ, the church, that in your wisdom and in your sovereignty, you have gathered your people together in local churches so they might grow in grace and glorify our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Father God, we pray, especially this morning, for this new baby church, this new representation locally of the bride of Christ. Lord, we pray first for their unity as a body, that they would be bound together having shared in the same uh, faith, in the same spirit, and the same baptism, that you would bring them together to be one, that they would be united in practice and theology, in love and care and concern, one in mind, that they would not be divided, that they would be patient with one another, that they would care for each other's needs, that they would cry with each other and rejoice with each other. Lord, we pray that they would be strong as they follow after Christ. Father God, I pray for their spiritual purity and righteousness as well. As they grow as a church, as you wash them with your word, with the preaching of the gospel, with their communion together, as they disciple one another and follow after Christ, Lord, I pray that you would sanctify them, that you would prepare them to be presented in that final day to Christ. Father God, I pray for their mission in the community. I pray for the neighborhood where the church will be. I pray for the neighborhoods where they live. I pray for the greater Greensboro area and even all, to, all the way to the end of the earth, I pray that they would be faithful to Christ in pointing their lost neighbors to him. I pray they will be a light in this dark world. I pray that they would be a salt to those who are around them. And I pray that through them, Jesus Christ will be glorified. As you gather the nations to yourself, would you use this local body for your glory? God, I pray that as they go and begin this work, Father God, that you would be near with them, that they would depend on you, that they would cling to you, and that they would follow the chief shepherd, Jesus Christ. And now I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you the inheritance among all those who are sanctified. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You guys give it up uh, for the Redeemer Core team. <laughs> King's Cross, happy fifth birthday. It's a joy and pleasure to be with you. And to my precious daughter, happy 14th birthday as well. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Listen, there's so much for us to be grateful for on this fifth anniversary. God has been so faithful, so kind. There was so much to celebrate. But I want to start back just a little bit and think about uh, what God has done. In the spring of 2017, the Darsts, the Vandals, and the Tucks, along with Dustin, actually committed and relocated to Greensboro, where the Pruitts and the Middletons and Dylan Harris were ready and waiting for to, to go after this dream, to plant a church on the railroad tracks and by God's grace reach both sides. Five years in, now we're overwhelmed by all that God has done. Someone recently asked me, if you could go back and do it again, what would you do differently? My answer to that question, I said, well, okay, this might sound arrogant. I promise it's not. But the answer is nothing. 
That's not because everything went according to plan, but almost nothing did. <laughs> so I'm not sure that we did anything right, but the Lord has been faithful and kind. So we got here. We were supposed to launch in September of 2017 at Magnolia Street Baptist Church. That fell apart in August. <laughs> so suddenly, as it falls apart, Pastor BT and Pastor Jeremy from Cross Fellowship reach out to us and say, hey, time out. Maybe we want to join in with you guys. So we pushed the launch back to November rather than September. So again, not in the location we planned, not at the time we planned, not even with the original core team that we planned. The 12 suddenly became a lot more with this other core from this other church. So then we launched in Kaiser Middle School, where every Sunday morning we were greeted by the lingering smell of square pizza and tater tots. <laughs> but we gathered and we launched, and God was faithful and kind. We spent some time there, and then he relocated us to Eugene Street, in a warehouse where we were greeted by the lingering smell of hair salons and nail salons. I don't know what it is about King's Cross in some sense, but it was uh, interesting in those early days. But the Lord faithfully added to our number beginning even then and continued to grow his church. Then on a Friday night, we got a phone call that said, hey, there's a fire code issue. You can't meet here just before our second anniversary and so we had to relocate, and we came to here at the time, Parkway Baptist Church, and we came that Sunday evening. And for five months, we joked we were the homeless church wandering around the wilderness looking for somewhere to meet on Sunday mornings, failing again and again and again to find anywhere else to meet. So we entered into conversations with Parkway Baptist Church. Perhaps they could merge in with us, and this could be our permanent home. Just as conversations were really getting going, that monster called COVID hit in March of 2020. So suddenly, now, all along with the rest of the world, we're shut down. We're trying to figure out Zoom meetings. And, uh, and again, whoo, everybody hates Zoom nowadays, right? Amen. Like, we're trying to figure out how to do online and the whole conversation and, and survive through all of that. But in God's providence, because he had moved us here, that May, we were able to start gathering right on the front lawn and continue worshiping. And so we saw our church continue to grow and the Lord be faithful and kind to us. And the Parkway Saints celebrated as they saw answers to their prayers to reach the surrounding neighborhood as people would be walking their dogs on Sunday mornings, see us on the front lawn and stop in and listen to God's word. And then in uh, that July, Parkway Baptist Church voted to merge, to give us the property and merge in and become a part of King's Cross. We spent the last two years renovating and making this home our home. Throughout it all, God has been so faithful. We've watched dead, spiritually dead people go to life. People have come to faith. We've seen people baptized and profess their faith publicly to a watching world. BT and Jeremy and then Hez and Craig and then Charlie and Cameron have joined Luke and I to pastor this flock. Phil, Phil and Gail Simmons, Kevin Simmons, Larry Brown, Brianna Pruitt, Alicia Tuck, Mike Radford, Ronnie and Chelsea Camo, Taylor Middleton, and Cindy Shaw have served or are serving faithfully as deacons of this church. Countless others have served and led in incredible ways. Slowly but surely, we've watched as God really has reconciled people to himself and to one another across social, economic, ethical, or ethnical, or ethnic and cultural barriers bringing them together to form one new body. We've sent out members overseas to advance the gospel. And this morning, we've commissioned our first church plant, Redeemer Church, to take the gospel to the Glenwood neighborhood where they're merging in with Glenwood Church, a church down there already to repeat the same story. God has been so faithful. He has been so kind. He's promised to be with us. He has been with us and has used us according to his purposes for his great glory and for the joy of those gathered and so relatively briefly compared to most Sunday mornings, I want to lead us to worship by preaching Psalm 100, a psalm of thanksgiving. What I want you to see in this psalm is that knowing God leads to joyful singing and glad service for the spread of his glory among all peoples for all generations. That knowing him, knowing the one true God, really knowing him, leads to a joyful singing and a glad service such that he might get glory among all nations for all generations. This is what happens when you know the God of the Bible. There's something that happens inside of you. There's a connection between what you know and true knowledge about this God and the affections that well up in the heart that lead to a sacrificial life of worship. So let's pray and ask God for his help as we jump into Psalm 100. Father God, we come to you through Christ, our crucified, dead, buried, and resurrected Lord. Asking, would you help us see you accurately? 
And help us celebrate you passionately. For you are worthy. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. So just to set context and structure for you, Psalm 100. Psalm 100 is a culmination of a section of the Psalms known often referred to as the kingship Psalms. Psalm 93 and then Psalm 95 through 100. Now the royal language is not used in Psalm 100 as it is in the rest of them. But the language when it opens up and begins with uh, enter and make a joyful noise. Or as the CSB translates it, shout triumphantly. This is the same kind of language when you're entering into the king's courts and you're celebrating and highlighting his royalty, his kingship. And so indeed, it is a psalm of giving thanks as the heading itself says. Now the psalm I want you to notice is broken up into four stanzas. Stanza one is made up of verses one and two and it begins this call to exuberant praise, to joyful singing, to glad serving, to crying out and make joyful shouts to the Lord. And then it's followed by the second stanza that tells you why you ought to be doing that. And then stanza three, again, is this call to praise and glorify, to thank him, to sing out and bless his name. And then stanza four, the last verse, is telling you this is why you ought to do that. So I want to read the the whole psalm to you again and point that out to you, and then we'll jump in and make some observations. So again, a psalm for giving thanks. So notice this first call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. That stands a one. Worship. Why should we worship? Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Second call to worship. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Why? For the Lord is good. His steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to all generations. What I want to do for, with our purposes for today is I want you to see this connection between the head and the heart, between true knowledge of God and right affections for God. Because by the Spirit, both must be present for it to be worship that is pleasing to God. We must have right knowledge about God, and that right knowledge about God ought to lead to the right kind of affections for God. For right affections grounded in wrong knowledge is merely idolatry. So if you've got all kinds of affections for God, but it's grounded in wrong knowledge of God, you're worshiping a false God. Right knowledge without, or right affections without right knowledge is idolatry. However, right knowledge that does not produce right affections is dead religion. Demons believe and shudder. They have right theology, but no affections. Dead religion. But right knowledge that leads to right affections That's the kind of worship Psalm 100 tells us leads to joyful singing and glad service for the glory of God among all nations. So our goal in our time as we think about and celebrate God's faithfulness and kindness to our particular church, but then to his people throughout all times and all places, is to send down our roots deep into true knowledge of God. That out of those deep roots and true knowledge of God might grow a towering oak tree of praise and worship that shades those under its care and comfort and indeed drops forth seeds that reproduces more worshipers that send their roots deep down into the soil of knowledge of God and grow forth oaks of praise. So to summarize then what we'll learn, I need somebody to look at your neighbor and say, look at God and give him glory. <clears throat> this is what we're going to learn. We're going to look at God and give him glory. True knowledge about God and give him glory. Look at God. See him as he truly is and give him praise. If you really see him, I promise you'll sing. You can't see him and not sing. If you don't want to sing, you're not seeing. There's a connection. Look at God. Give him glory. Six truths I want to quickly show you. Looking at him. And then I want you to give him glory. Six truths. Again, make a joyful noise. Why? Why should we make a joyful noise? Why should we serve with gladness? Why should we come into his presence with singing? Three things we learn from verse 3. First, our God is the one true God. Our God is the one true God. Notice the psalmist says, know that the Lord, he is God. Now what's he saying right here? He's not just being redundant. Lord, look at it. It's in all caps. What's that word? That's the word Yahweh. This is the personal name of God. God who's revealed himself uniquely to his people. Know that Yahweh is Elohim. Know that this God, this, one, this, this Lord who's revealed himself intimately and personally to his people, namely to Moses, this God, Yahweh, is the one true God. He is God Almighty. Yahweh is Elohim. 
This God, our God, is the one true God. Remember when we studied in Exodus earlier this year, when Moses was having the interaction with God of the burning bush. And then he asked him, like, who should I say sent me? And God answered, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. I am Yahweh. I'm not any old generic God like these false gods in Egypt. They're pansies compared to me. <laughs> like, no, no, you're dealing with the one true God, the one almighty God, the only God there is. And he says, and I'm revealing myself to you intimately. I'm giving you my name, Yahweh. Our God is the one true God. Yahweh, his personal name that he's revealed to special people. He's not just a God among many gods. He's the only God. He's the one true God. And in Christ, in Christ, this side of the cross, we know. Jesus says, no, no, I've come to make the invisible God visible. That I've revealed to you. Jesus, his name, Yeshua, means Yahweh saves. That our God is a God who's slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. And he's come to save those who would look to him in repentance and faith. Our God is the one true God. And so we make a joyful noise. We shout triumphantly like the psalmist in Psalm 66. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give him to glorious praise. Say to God, how awesome are your deeds. So great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you. All the earth worships you and sing praises to you. They sing praises to your name. Selah. So we as the people of God, our God, the one true God, can shout triumphantly, you have no rival. You have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the name above all names. Look at God, our God, the one true God, and give him glory. Secondly, he is our glorious maker. Our God's the one true God, and our God, he is our glorious maker. Again, look at verse 3, the second portion. It is he who made us, and we are, are his. You know, really, and often we talk about this in culture, but you need to know, biblically speaking, there's no such thing as a self-made man. I don't care what you've done with your life. You didn't make you. <laughs> he made us. We are created. And we're created, not just created, we're created in the image of God. Genesis 1 and 26 to 28 says, every man and woman's created in the Imago Dei, the image of God. Psalm 139 tells us he knitted us together in our mother's womb. God knows you better than you know you. He knit you together before you were aware you existed. He made us. He is our glorious maker. He knew you in the womb. And not only did he make every individual on the planet, he made Israel particularly. He called Abraham and Sarah. He blessed their womb in their old age. He said, I'm going to choose a people, and I'm going to choose a people, and I'm going to rig it in such a way that they understand they had nothing to do with this. I made them. I made them. No, not Ishmael, Isaac. I made them. My promises will come through the people that I have formed and made for myself. He built his people. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Children are a heritage from the Lord sent forth. He's continuing to give us much grace and send forth much children <laughs> from this church. But again, God made us in the image of, image of God, but he also made Israel. But also think about the church. Think about it in our studies in Matthew. We've just been going through King's Cross. When, when Jesus asked Peter, who do men say that I am? And they start giving the answers. And he says, but who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus' response is, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who's in heaven. And I tell you, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. We are made by God in his image. Israel made and formed as his people through Israel, the Messiah Christ, who says, I will build my church. We exist because of God. He is our glorious maker. He made the church and he made this church. King's Cross, think about all of the stories that put all of the people in this faith family that are in this faith family. Think of all the things God has had to do to bring together this family. He made us, not we ourselves. Therefore, he has sovereign authority over us. Understanding he's our glorious maker should produce humility in all humanity. Understanding you didn't make you should leave you trembling. Oh, somebody did, and therefore I'm accountable to him. But also notice back in verse 2, it should lead us to serve gladly. So we sing joyfully, but then he says, serve gladly. Why? Because he made you. 
And he calls you his. He created Israel. He created the church. He created this church. He made us, therefore we serve him gladly. As Paul says, do you not know your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom have you from God? Whom you have from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. But whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Pastors, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, which he obtained with his own blood. He made the church. How did he make the church? How did he purchase the church? With his own blood. Look at God, our glorious maker, and give him glory. Thirdly, he's our good shepherd. Again, notice, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Not only did he make us, he chose us. Again, think of God in the story of Israel. Israel, enslaved in Egypt, 400 years, all this bondage and suffering, and God says, no, no, I'm getting you out. I'm going to set you free. I'm going to demonstrate I am the maker. Therefore, I can smash all these false gods and set my people free. So he says, no, I'm your shepherd, and I'm the one who got you out. I took you out of Israel. I sent forth the ten plagues to demonstrate my superiority over all of these false so-called gods and powerfully delivered Israel out of bondage. And they sang. Remember, Israel gets delivered. They get set free. And what's the first thing they do? Exodus chapter 15. Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he's triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. This is my God, and I will praise him. My Father's God, I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. People who get saved sing. People get set free from their maker and understand my maker is not only my maker, he's my shepherd and will shepherd and care for me and guide me out, sing praises to his great name. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 43 had to remind Israel of this reality. Now thus says the Lord, he who created you, he made you, O Jacob. He who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name, you are mine. The maker and creator of all says, you're mine. I have particular interest in you to shepherd and care for you and guide you safely to still waters where your soul might drink in thirst or or satisfy your thirst. Isaiah also let us know that this good shepherd is going to save his people and gather his people climactically and ultimately through the suffering of his substitute. Isaiah 53, verse 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. So he's our shepherd, our good shepherd, our glorious maker, but our good shepherd. And Isaiah tells us somehow this is going to connect with a suffering servant. Who is this suffering servant? Who is the Christ king to come and who is this suffering servant? And how does this bring back straying sheep? What did the Lord Jesus say in John chapter 10? I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep, suffering substitute. He who is a hired hand and not a shepherd who does not own the sheep sees the wolf coming, leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf snatches them and scatters them. He flees because he's a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. But I'm the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I laid down my life for the sheep. Jesus Christ came and lived the perfect life that earned the shepherding care of the Father. He died on the cross, the death that rebellious runaway sheep deserve. He saw the wolf of our sin, the wolf of Satan and the wolf of death, and he refused to let us be snatched away. Instead, the good shepherd snatched us out of the grip of Satan's whispering lies. He snatched us out of the wrath our sin deserved, and he snatched our spiritual corpse out of the grave it lied dead in. He shed his blood as the sacrifice of atonement, and on the third day he resurrected that he might purchase us into the shepherding care of our great God. We are doubly owned. He made us and so he owns us, but he redeemed us through his blood. So he owns us twice. He's our creator and our redeemer, our shepherd. So we come into his presence singing 
What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is my hope and peace. This is all my righteousness. All precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. And because he's our good shepherd, we can say, my soul's got a shepherd in the valley and I shall not want. I shall not want because my cup's running over, running over. I shall not want because I have a good shepherd. Straying brother or sister living in sin, what are you doing? Return to the good shepherd. Take heed to Psalm 95. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as at Meribah, as on the day of Massa in the wilderness. When your fathers put me to the test, put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Straying sheep, come home to the good shepherd. Look at God, our good shepherd, and give him glory. The psalmist moves on to the third stanza. Again, calls for great praise because of three more great truths about God in the last stanza. Enter his gates, verse 4, with thanksgiving, his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. Why? Why should we enter his gates with thanksgiving? Why should his people enter his courts with praise? Why should we give thanks and bless his name? Three more reasons. For us, our point number four, he is good. He is good. Do this because he is good. Yahweh's not just our sovereign king and glorious maker. He's not merely all-powerful and almighty. He's our good shepherd. God is good in his essence and his activities. Everything that he is, everything that he does is perfectly good and just. And he invites us to enter. How could a good and just and righteous and holy God invite sinners to enter his presence if he's good and right and, and true and just and hates sin? How could he do this? We know on this side of the cross. Hebrews tells us, verse, chapter 10, verse 19, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Friend, especially non-Christian, I don't know if you thought too much about this. But if God is sovereign and not good, then we should only be terrified of him. If he is sovereign and good, then we need not be terrified of anything else. We enter through faith in Jesus with thanksgiving because Jesus took God's righteous wrath for us and distributes his grace and his mercy and love to us. So we enter with thanksgiving. That's why we come and enter his presence with thanksgiving. Psalm 25. How does God show his goodness? How would you show your goodness? Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble his way. God says, I flex my goodness on you by showing sinners the way to go. That's just what it's like to be a good God. Truly just, truly righteous, truly full of wrath, yet full of mercy and grace, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, showing sinners this is the way you go. And what does Jesus say in John 14, 6? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Demonstrating he's good. He's kept his holy, righteous name and his justice intact and yet distributed grace and mercy to sinners through Christ our Lord. Look at God. He is good and give him glory. Fifthly, he loves forever. Notice, his steadfast love endures forever. The love of God is like no other love. Friends, if you're in Christ this morning, I just want you to think on this for a moment. His gushing love for you hasn't lessened one ounce in the last 386 years, the last 38 minutes or the last six seconds, and it won't let up one drop over the next three million years. Just love, enduring, eternal, infinite love given to his people. His love transcends your good weeks and bad weeks. His love does, for you does not ebb and flow on good days and bad days. He loves you because he loves you. He loves you because he is love. And his love for you will endure because he endures forever. 
His love is poured out, gushing on you in this moment as much as any moment you've ever experienced, and it will continue to be poured out on you because of his love. Think about the grace and mercy of his love. What does Paul tell us in Romans chapter 5 that is different about the love of God in Christ? For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die, normal, normal love, one will scarcely die for a righteous person. Perhaps for a good person one would dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. God in Christ didn't express his climactic love when you were at your best, but when you were at your worst. So that you understand and know he loved me at my worst. He will never love me less. If he loved me enough to give up his son in order to bring me into his good shepherding care when I was at my worst, what does it feel like now to have him as my father crying out, Abba, Father, by the Spirit? Love, love, love. He loves us in Christ. And that love endures forever. It's eternal. You guys, you guys know the, wor- the, the precious words, Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will you not also with him graciously give us all things? Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn Christ? Jesus is the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who indeed is interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we're being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No. In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I'm sure that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. You cannot get away from his eternal love. It will be effusive for all eternity, gushing forth for all eternity for you to enjoy. Therefore, we enter with praise. Glory be his name. He loves us. He loves us. Our God loves us. Sinners, he's made a way that we can enjoy this love forever. Look at God. He loves forever and give him glory. Lastly, he is faithful forever. Notice, in his faithfulness to all generations. You know, God has never broken a promise. He's never come up short. He's never said he would do something and not do it. He's never said he would do something and not be able to do it. He's never said he would do something, then his emotions changed and him not feel like doing it later. He's kept all of his promises. All the promises of God are yes and amen in Christ Jesus, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. He will build his church, not even the gates of hell, nor COVID, nor political agendas, nor persecution, nor sin, nor death, nor Satan will stop it. King's Cross has the Lord not been faithful. From Magnolia Street to the Kaiser Cafeteria to the warehouse on Eugene to Sunday nights here to Sundays out there to Sunday mornings back in here to Sunday mornings over there and sometimes with no power to Sunday mornings back in here. Has he not been faithful? Has he not kept his promises? He will do what he wants for the sake of his great glory and our eternal gladness in him. He is faithful. Has he not been faithful to carry us through the highest of highs on the mountaintop and the lowest of lows in the valley in a broken world? Even when a brother like Tim comes to faith. And then we have to have a tragic funeral all too soon. Was he not faithful to sustain and carry? Even when we suffer through the gut-wrenching loss of our brother Desmond, we're not able to lean on the goodness and faithfulness of God as a faith family. Is that not why Noceda and those precious kids are still being cared for and encouraged and walking and faithful to the Lord even today? Is it not because of the goodness and faithfulness of God? Is that not what our brother Des would say? That's what you better be doing. Even as our sister Gretel suffers through unspeakable anguish with cancer, our God is faithful forever. We can trust him. He is faithful, so we sing. There's a Savior in the valley place. He's walking beside me and he knows my pain. God, the beginning and the end. God right there in the midst of it. Joy, this is the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is my strength. He's my hope. There's going to be glory. There's going to be glory. There'll be glory after this. No need to worry. This present suffering, there's going to be glory after this. Our God is faithful. We give thanks and bless his name. Look at God. He's faithful forever. 
and give him glory. And lastly, as application, this is why we plant churches. Do you notice at the beginning of the psalm and the end of the psalm, the psalm opens, who's to make a joyful noise to the Lord? All the earth. The psalm ends, his steadfast love endures forever and his faithfulness to what? All generations. The whole earth, every tribe, tongue, and nation ought to sing the praises of this God. They don't know him. That's why they're not singing. They need to know him. That's why we go. Not just this generation, the next generation. This is why we reproduce and plant churches and raise our children up in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. Because people don't know God and he's beautiful. He's lovely. He's worthy of worship. If they would just see him, they would sing and serve with gladness and joy. And so we must plant churches. We must send out our best. Knowing that one day we'll gather all back together and there'll be one chorus. There'll be no more crying. There'll be no more sending out. They'll be gathered around the throne with the purchased blood of Christ, the Lamb of God, with his bride, celebrating. We'll all sing, every tribe, tongue, and nation. And we'll say, holy is his name. Holy is his name. Holy is his name. And we'll give him glory forever. And we'll be eternally glad. This is our great God. So Cameron, Zane, Preston, the rest of the Redeemer team, the people of Glenwood and the surrounding areas need to know our God is the one true God so that they might shout triumphantly. The people of Glenwood need to know he's our glorious maker so they might serve him gladly. They need to know that he's our good shepherd. They might sing about him passionately. They need to know he's good so they might enter his presence thankfully. They need to know he is loved so they might praise him affectionately. And they need to know he's faithful so they might glorify him rightly. So go plant this church with great blessing and love. We will miss you, but we'll be with you in prayer and gospel partnership. And let us all sing and serve gladly for our God is worthy. His love and faithfulness endure forever. And that chorus in glory is getting ready. The angels are there. They can't wait. Every tribe, tongue, and nation, it's going to be glorious. Until that day, let's live to know him and make him known. Let's look at God and give him glory in the whole earth and in every generation. Let's close in prayer. King's Cross began in a lot of ways as a dream in 2008, 2009, and here we are five years in. And that dream is so many ways being realized, the dream to plant a church uh, on the railroad tracks and see God reconcile people across socioeconomic lines, cultural lines, ethnic lines, uh, generational lines, and to bring them into one family, uh, to form one church that would learn to love and grow together, to love one another, to love God, and to love uh, and preach the gospel to a lost and dying world, and to demonstrate great mercy and kindness. It is our intention to equip and train our people to carry out the mission of the church as we come together in uh, small groups, in community groups, uh, in discipleship groups. Uh, we're training and equipping and preparing our members to, to make disciples. It's been a true gift to actually do life um, with the people that I go to church with. Like my weekends are filled with hanging out with families, with soccer, with, with birthday parties, with so many things that uh, have just been a gift to my soul that I didn't know I was missing nor that I even needed. Our church loves to serve and just love other people. It's just a direct display of what they tasted and see from the overwhelming and undeserving love um, that they've experienced in the gospel. We desire within in our local body, within our local outpost of the kingdom, to see tribes and tongues and nations brought together and how the Lord has worked to do that and even our minority brothers and sisters, so many of the sacrifices that they've made and the encouragement that's been, I thank God over and over and over again. It was challenging, but it feels like man, the work was was definitely worth it. And I say that not as if we've reached the peak or the pinnacle. It's still things that are challenging, you know, and there's still work to be done culturally in our church. But I think we've definitely been able to get to a place where we're seeing even young students from A&T come into our church and be able to feel like this can be their home. I think we quickly learned that, that across different cultures, different environments, uh, that it was different. And it resulted in a congregation delighting in Jesus all the more in a different way than maybe some were used to. It even helped us in 
discipling each other to be more comfortable with being uncomfortable. We were so glad to be part of King's Cross. We were able to uh, adapt to the new, new form of worship, and we love it. And uh, we were certainly not comfortable, but we felt safe here. He's changing us. He is uh, continually working in our hearts and lives. It's just so exciting to watch God working in the lives of so many people, day by day. We were looking for a biblically-based, Christ-centered, um, racially diverse church. And so we came, and it, it, it's just been a blessing. The singing of our family, honestly, is one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard. It's so powerful. So many different people who would not come together for any other reason exactly. but our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our people love to sing. And so we've said from the get-go, we want to sing true things about God. And we want the congregation's voice to be the most important instrument in the room. There are moments uh, in corporate worship every week where I just have to stop singing for a second and just listen. I love the fellowship of the believers at King's Cross. I see different people from different neighborhoods and from other cultures, and they're all coming together, singing and praising God at the same time. And I actually get to know the guy sitting in the chair beside me. And it's that personal relationship of having that day-to-day, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute walk with Christ. This community of believers that are brought together by nothing that human hands could make, but, but simply by the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, we're the adopted sons and daughters of God, and all of a sudden it's like, we're in this family. It's just one of the rich joys as a dad to see how much our kids love the church and they understand the church is not a building, it's not brick and mortar, it's the people. And it's the people they love and the most significant relationships in their lives. And so I'm just so grateful. We are ministering to these kids week in and week out, caring for their needs, caring for their souls, telling them what, what God's word says and praying for them, that God would give them new hearts, that they would believe in Christ and repent of their sin. That may bear fruit tomorrow and it may bear fruit years from now, but it is our job to point them to Christ. It's the people, it's the relationships, and not just the kids their age, but it's the community of believers. There's a love, there's a care, there's a concern, there's, there's a desire for a relationship. The love we have for one another and the discipleship within our body, we are just blessed beyond measure. The richness of the gospel is communicated through every sermon, every relationship, every decision. We knew we needed to be plugged in with a healthy church where we could grow together in our marriage and, and, and move forward in the brokenness, uh, moving towards wholeness. And King's Cross is where we found that home. Every Lord's Day I walk out with the deepest of my hungers filled and satisfied by Him, O Lord God Almighty. I love our pastors, and I like to welcome a lot of people. When new people come, they love them and make them welcome to the church. And we like doing church. We exist to glorify God by making disciples who advance the gospel for the good of all peoples. And we have an opportunity to do that through the ministry opportunities we have. God told the children of Israel to not despise the widows, the fatherless, the sojourner, and the poor. And so we've taken those four and have tried to partner with and create ministry opportunities for our people to live out the gospel command to be missional and to reach people with the gospel. The elders faithfully preach and teach, and we get to talk about it with brothers and sisters who are all striving to be more like Jesus. This church and these people, this community, make it really easy to invite people in. I was just, you know, just living my life, uh, you know, how I wanted. Brittany invited me to come to church with her. Once I started coming to church and start listening to the words being preached, I started praying. I asked the Lord to like, show me, you know, how to follow Him. We've got so many different ways for our people to learn and to grow. We feel a great heavy burden and responsibility for church planting because we believe that the best way to accomplish the Great Commission is to plant churches. You know, when you're stepping out in faith doing something like starting a new church, I mean, you realize, you know, how much you do need to have this childlike dependence on God and 
people on this core team starting this new faith family with us who love us and we love them and you know all of that support we see as like that's that's a means of God's grace in which he is um, ministering to us and allowing us to minister to those around us and to be able to leave a faith family we love to go start a new faith family to bring what everyone loves and values about the DNA and the culture of King's Cross and to say, hey, let's take that to a community that doesn't have that. Um, and then if the Lord is gracious and adds to our number, let's keep that cycle going. So one day we can look back and say, man, look at all these strategic families that have been sent out from this mother church. And now look at the gospel presence in the city of Greensboro as a result of what God's been doing. Yeah, King's Cross is our family. Our kids have spiritual aunts and uncles and We've got spiritual aunts and uncles too, the, the older saints and how they've just poured into all of our lives and having that kind of relationship is like no other. <laughs> we have a lot of great things to say about King's Cross, but when we do that, we're really just bragging about God, about his goodness, about his faithfulness, how he's brought us together uh, so that we might grow in our love and affection towards Christ and work together shoulder to shoulder in this great mission. We're all created in the image of God. And because we're all created in the image of God, we mourn with those who mourn, we celebrate with those who celebrate. This is the support that lets me know that they really care about me. I'm thankful to the Lord for all that He's done for us, um, through us, and to us. We are all desiring to seek God's glory and to seek what he's going to do next with this community that, that he continues to grow and shape as we grow together. God has been faithful and he's been kind. And our church has, by God's grace, seen people come to faith, see people baptized, see people growing, discipling one another for the first time, see people engaging and sharing the gospel with their non-Christian friends and family members and coworkers, and seeing people uh, demonstrate uh, and display great mercy and kindness to those who are in need, whether it's the poor, the hurting, the fatherless, the widow. And so high highs, low lows. We've grieved together, we've lamented together, we've celebrated together, we've enjoyed Christ together. And in so many ways, again, just feel like we're living the dream. This church is our family. It's the people we call in joys and in sorrows who we love to worship King Jesus with. It's one of my greatest joys to be a part of this church and to have these people be our faith family. We know that eternal glory is in front of us and that God has put this work together. And we're excited to see the journey as he takes us from five years in to whatever he has for us in the future.